so they'd be like oh um so what are you gonna do there and <laughs> say i'm gonna go to film school i'm gonna study screenwriting and they'd be like oh so what are you gonna do with that like just <laughs> like it's like oh so you're just gonna be a starving artist your entire life and like i i didn't i don't think i ever said this to them because i wasn't that sassy at this point but like I was sort of like, okay, you're a doctor. You know how when you come off a shift and you're not ready to sleep yet, but you want to relax and turn on the TV, uh, I'm going to do that for you. And you're going to like enjoy all of that. You need that. Welcome to the Story Tinker Podcast, a place for in-depth analysis of stories, mainly from Webtoon. Co-hosted by sharp, witty, and dare I say thirsty fans, we dive deep in every episode, analyzing character struggles, relationship development, and of course, theories. We also interview people working in creative industries. You can follow The Story Tinker on YouTube, podcast platforms, and social media. For bonus content, sneak peeks, and more, you can support The Story Tinker on Patreon. We're really appreciative of your likes, subscribes, follows, comments, and ratings on all platforms. Thanks for listening to The Story Tinker, and let's get started. In this Meet the Tinker interview, we talk to Carol Brown Ahmed, the author of Big Evil Energy on Webtoons, who has also worked on a number of film productions. Carol didn't even like writing as a kid, and it took a math and science high school to get her to write a script and realize, hey, she liked it. We talk about how she overcomes self-doubt and her work on the television show Blackish and the new movie Cheaper by the Dozen. Carol was a huge Archie Comics fan, so she was thrilled to get the opportunity to pitch a story to Archie's comics and webtoons, and that's how we ended up with Big Ethel Energy. We talk about the messages Carol tries to impart in the story, and how she actually likes having structure to help guide her creativity. We're so thankful that Carol came on to discuss her work. Check them all out in the links in the description. Hi everyone, and welcome to our third, it'll be our third, Meet the Tinker interview. And today we have Carol, and Carol, um, well, I'm going to first ask Carol to very briefly just say what you're up to right now in your life, and then as we go through the interview, we'll find out everything else that you've done from from birth to now. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, so my name is Carol Brown Ahmed, and right now I am writing a webtoon called Archie Comics colon Big Ethel Energy. That's the full title. Um, most people just call it Big Ethel Energy. Um, and aside from that, I am uh, kind of in between gigs right now. I'm hoping the next one starts up within the next couple months. Um, and I just finished working on a movie uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but we're just wrapping that up right now, just doing really final things. So that's kind of what's going on in my life right now. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about that because that, um, the movie that you worked on, if I think we're talking about the same thing, is actually something that I read as a kid. So we'll get into that. But also, my ask- cat, Merle, he will probably, he loves Zoom, so he'll probably walk by a bunch of times. <laughs> that's true. So one of the things I, I always like to know when I meet people is what did you want to do growing up? Because for me, I always wonder like how many people get to do what they wanted to do growing up and how did, if that doesn't change at all. So what was, yeah, what, what, when you were a kid, like, was there something that you were like, I want to do this? Um, you know, it's funny. I didn't really like writing until I was probably 15. Um, so it's not like I have some friends who like basically as soon as they could talk and read they knew that they wanted to be writers that was not really me um I like at one point I you know like most kids are like I want to be a ballerina or whatever I was like I want to be a psychologist (laughs) so I I think it was one of our my sister and I have a very close uh, friend whose mom is a psychiatrist. So that probably had something to do with it. Um, But then when I got a bit older uh, and I really started, you know, thinking about stuff, I was really interested in architecture. I still am. I love architecture and furniture design. Um, And so I kind of had the plan to go into some sort of architecture thing. Um, But then when I was a teenager, I realized, I'm really not that good at math and science and you need a lot of that. Um, so I, and at the same time, I realized I really enjoyed writing. So that's when I switched tracks. That is very cool. By the way, I actually, both of those things that you said, psychology and architecture are both things I looked into. Well, psychology for me, I thought I was going to be a psychologist for a full 10 years from like 16 to 26. Oh, wow. And then I applied and got accepted to an architecture school 
Um, mm -hmm. I, I didn't go because it wouldn't have made financial sense. Like it was very mm -hmm. expensive and the, the salary wouldn't be justified like the student loans, but that, that's cool. I, I read one book on architecture. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot everything in it. Like, but I, from there, I learned that everything that you see in a house like has a name, like every part of the house, and you can mm -hmm. describe it. <laughs> yeah, I'm like the thing under the thing that looks like the thing. <laughs> right, exactly. That's how most people describe things in their houses. Yeah, <laughs> even me most of the time. Like, I I know that they all have words, but like. I'm not going to just whip out these like very specific terms in like casual conversation, you know, so I'm like, you know, the Eve by the thing. And yeah, anyway. I'm impressed. So yeah, so when you decided that you wanted to go to writing, what happened then? What did you do? Um, well, so the reason I got into writing in the first place was I, so I actually, the irony is that I went to a like magnet high school for math and science. Mm -hmm. Um, and I went there because I really loved math, but then I had a string of teachers that just like, were not good at making me enjoy the subject. So, um, and I, I was never good at science. So I sort of, and, and our school also had a really great humanities program. So I had a string of really amazing English teachers. And, um, one year I, my math class, my teacher was just so horrible that, it was actually like pretty comical the way the class went because like we just were all like, what is going on? And so I wrote a one act play about it. Um, I started out writing a um, a short story and then I it was just like dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. I was like, wait a second, there's a writing form that is this, it's a script, you know? So that's sort of how I realized that I really liked writing scripts because my stuff was all very dialogue heavy. Um, and so when I was in high school, I did a mix of uh, plays and like, you know, short screenplays and things like that, uh, but mainly focused on theater. And then uh, when I was applying for college, I sort of decided I visited USC and NYU and I was like, no, I, I think movies are where it's at for me. So um, so then I went to USC for film school. I went through the screenwriting program there and that sort of got me started on the career path that I'm on now. So it was like pretty straightforward. Like, you know, I decided I was interested in it, started doing it as a hobby, went to school, now it's a career. Cool. So was there any conflict along the way? Did you ever get any pushback from family or friends were like, oh, you know, there's so many people trying to make it in that field. You'll never make it. <laughs> Don't do it. Um, so my parents uh, have always been really supportive of me. Um, my mom is definitely a little more anxious, less now, but like when I was in school and just out of school, still like really trying to get my foot in the door. She was just like, Ugh you should have gotten an MBA or been a dentist or something like that, but they didn't like nag me about it. I just know from talking to her now that she felt anxious about it. So like, I've been very lucky that um, they're so supportive. But uh, when I was in high school, our senior year, when we were all, because I went to, my high school was like, it was a public school, but it was very prestigious. And like almost everybody, if not everybody went to some sort of college or university. Um, and my friends and I were all the ambitious sort and, but a lot of my friends were into math and science. And so they were going to like pre-med or uh, finance or whatever. And so a lot of my friends' parents around that time of the year would be like, oh, where did you decide to go to school? What are you going to be doing next year? And I'd say, I'm going to USC. Well, I had to say I'm going to the University of Southern California because I'm from Virginia. And if you say USC in Virginia, they think South Carolina. Mm -hmm. So I would say I'm going to USC. It's in Los Angeles. Uh, and they're like, oh, because to them, the only acceptable schools on the West Coast are Stanford and Berkeley and Caltech. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so they'd be like, oh, um, so what are you going to do there? and say, I'm going to go to film school. I'm going to study screenwriting. They'd be like, oh, so what are you going to do with that? Like, just, <laughs> like, it's like, oh, so you're just going to be a starving artist your entire life. And like, I, I didn't, 
I don't think I ever said this to them because I wasn't that sassy at this point, but like, I was sort of like, okay, you're a doctor. You know how, when you come off a shift and you're not ready to sleep yet, but you want to relax and turn on the TV, Uh, I'm going to do that for you. And you're going to like, enjoy all of that. You need that, you know? Um, But yeah, so that was really the only like sort of pushback or doubt that I ever really got. Um, I mean, mainly the, like, it was mostly self-doubt. Like I said, my parents were pretty supportive. So for me, it was just like, can I really do this? Is this really going to happen for me? Things like that. And I still feel that way some, sometimes, but I'm definitely closer to my goals now. So. so I guess I'd love to hear more about that because I know that's something um, I struggle with. <laughs> oddly, real, oddly enough, because most of my life I've been very, very confident. Um, but lately for various reasons, I do struggle with that because I wonder, you know, will I ever get to do the creative things I want to do? So I'd love to hear more about like what you felt and how you overcame that if you did. And you said you still feel it sometimes, but yeah, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, when I applied to film school, I had no idea what likelihood I had of getting in. Um, it was kind of a shot in the dark because I knew nothing about the film industry at that point. I just like, I knew that I loved watching movies and that I really understood story structure. But beyond that, beyond being able to write my own stuff, I had no idea about the industry or film school or anything. Um, so it was, I mean, it was, I, I wouldn't say it was a surprise when I got in because I like, I was aware that I was a good writer, but it was like a very pleasant, somewhat surprise, you know, to be like, oh, I actually, like, I had no idea before. I just thought I might be good. And now I actually, like, somebody's confirmed it, you know? Um, So there was that. But then when I uh, actually, like, right before I went to school, I was like, oh, my God, what if... um, what if the only good thing I'll ever write was that application Mm -hmm. and I'm going to go there and just not have any more stories and I'm going to fail. And that was like really heavy anxiety for me leading up to starting film school. And then once I was there, I was like, Oh wait, no, it like, I have, I have things to write. It's fine. Um, And I mean, it helps that, you know, you have teachers who are helping you sort of, uh, foster your storytelling skills. And like, honestly, a lot of film school is, it's not really about, sorry, my cat's rearranging his litter box right now. Um, I don't hear it, don't worry. Great. Okay. Um, so it, a lot of film school is just, at least for writers, is um, it's kind of like therapy. Like <laughs> you learn how to take criticism Um, you learn how to like set some sort of discipline for yourself. Um, and it's, you know, the idea that like, yeah, you you can't really create talent in somebody, you can foster it, but like they, they picked us because they knew that we like had what it take, what it took creatively. Um, so a lot of film school was just learning how to actually like, sit down and write and how to formulate those ideas from like a tiny little bit moving into something larger um and dealing with that sort of self-doubt um and worrying about and I like like I said I still feel it sometimes like for instance um over the course of the pandemic it I mean I think one the pandemic itself has been hard on everyone and for me that has manifested somewhat creatively um And, uh, in addition, I, so I have depression and anxiety and in the past year and a half, they, the depression in particular has kind of flared up. And so that hasn't been helpful when it comes to, uh, like thinking of story ideas and moving forward with them. Luckily now I have an idea that I'm feeling pretty confident about and I'm actually getting back into writing something which feels really good because it's been really weird not to be work usually before two years ago at any point if you had asked me what I was working on I'd be writing something um 
But I think the other thing about the past year is one, I've been writing the webtoon and two, I've had a pretty demanding job aside from the webtoon. So, you know, it's not just pandemic and depression. It's also just time, but, Mm -hmm. um, but the webtoon has been nice because it's really sort of pushed me to, um, produce something every week, you know, and, and churn out something. And it's like, it's definitely not always perfect, but I always have something to turn in. And that feels really good. Um, despite the fact that I'm not being as productive with my other, uh, you know, my personal portfolio. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that was a very long and rambling answer. I hope that, you know, I'm fascinated. I'm really enjoying this. So before we get to the book too, and I'd love to hear like what, you know, what happened before that? Like when, when you graduated college, what, what projects did you work on? And, you know, if you can go, go through them and let's hear about them. Yeah, sure. Um, so a lot of people, uh, especially people who want to be writers or directors are encouraged in, uh, or I should say writers or producers are encouraged at the end of film school to get a job at an agency. Um, because that sort of fast tracks you, uh, to where you want to be. Cause you're meeting so many people that have the power to like put you on a staff or buy your script or whatever. Um, but those jobs are also really abusive. And I knew that I didn't want to be in that environment because it was really unhealthy. Uh, and also everyone I knew that took a job there, they just stopped writing because they didn't have time. They didn't have energy. They were being yelled at 12 hours a day. Uh, so I took a job oh, yeah, actually. Yeah, agencies where they, when you say stop writing, meaning stop writing on their own projects because they're working mm-hmm. to other people's. They weren't working. They were assistants to mm-hmm. agents. Um, and so they're doing a lot of just um, scheduling calls, emails, also reading other people's work and giving notes and things like that. But it's a very demanding job for not a lot of money, not a lot of like, it's, yeah, it's just, it's not a good environment. Um, and I was like, I can't stop writing. That's not going to be good for my career. So I took a job at USC, um, where I was, you know, I just graduated, uh, it was a job in a different department and it was nice because it was also in the film school and it was in a producing program. So I actually learned sort of by osmosis, just being around it um a lot about producing and then at the same time the hours were good enough that I was able to uh work on my own stuff you know nights and weekends um so I was there for three and a half years and in the middle of that time I traveled to Taiwan just to visit a friend uh and he happened to be in development on his first feature film And so he and the director, he was producing it. They were like, hey, you're a writer. Um, Could you look over our uh, outline of our story and just let us know what you think feedback wise? Um, And I read the outline and I was like, oh, this is totally up my alley story wise. Like this is the kind of stuff that I really enjoy writing. And so we decided that I would write the script for them. And it, it was interesting because that project, actually they shot it in... Chinese and Taiwanese. So I don't speak those languages. I wrote it in English and then I worked with a translator, um, Mm -hmm. which was cool. And like, you know, that's definitely not something most writers ever have to do. Um, So I wrote that script that got produced, um, which was very cool. It was a fun process. Um, And then after that, I, what is it called? I mean, all right. Oh, um, it, yeah, so it's a Taiwanese like indie film called At Road's End. Um, and it came out in 2018, 2017 or 18. Yeah. Um, so yes. And the, it's directed by oh, Pratik Sukhaitu. Are you doing Ching Mei Chang? Maybe. Produced by Gideon Wells. If what? that, the it, the producer is Gideon Wells. The director is Pratik Suketu. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here it is. Yeah. It, it has like an IMDb page, I think. Yeah. yeah. It's about a photographer. Mm-hmm. Okay. Awesome. I'll link it. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. No, it was it was a really fun project. It's kind of like a revenge 
drama about a woman who has left her small farming town uh, and goes back. And uh, it's set in the 80s when in Taiwan there was like a big, a big push towards industrialization, which kind of ruined a bunch of small farming communities. So um, yeah, so that was a really fun project and I learned a lot. Um, and a couple, hi Merle, um, <laughs> a couple of years later, I felt like I was ready to move on from my job at USC. And so I, through the connections I had made in that program, I got a job as the showrunner's assistant on Blackish for season five. Um, and that was, I mean, I'm so thankful that I got that job because that has really sort of led me to everything else that I've, well, not the webtoon, but it led me to a couple other jobs that I've done that I really enjoyed. Um, so I did one season on there and then one of the executive producers hired me to be her assistant on the film she was about to direct for various reasons that ended up being delayed for two years. So we were supposed to shoot it in 2019. We ended up shooting it in 2021. Um, but in the meantime, I freelanced a lot. I actually directed a commercial for a startup, which was really fun. Um, I helped my boss on some other projects uh, because I, she knew that it was like, she wanted to work with me, but the movie was taking forever. And she was like, well, I have these other projects, personal projects that I'm working on and I could use an assistant on them. So she would hire me sort of freelance for those. Um, yes, can you, I would love to hear more about what it was like being a showrunner's assistant on Blackish and yeah, what that involved. Yeah, sure. So um, it was, uh, so it's a, for anybody who doesn't watch the show or know about it, um, it's a comedy on ABC. It actually just uh, wrapped up its last season. Um, and it was created by Kenya Barris. This, the year that I started was the first year he wasn't the showrunner, which is why they were looking for a new showrunner's assistant because he was leaving to go to Netflix. A new showrunner was coming in. That person needed an assistant. So, um, there were actually two showrunners and each one had an assistant. So it was me and another showrunner and our guests were right next to each other. And thankfully we got along really well. Um, and we did a mix. We weren't in the writer's room uh, constantly like the writer's assistants and the script coordinator who are the other support staff on the show. Um, we did a lot, we did a mix of helping our bosses with, you know, proofing and, and other writing tasks, but then also a lot of production stuff. So like my boss directed an episode. So the week he was on set, I was on set with him. Um, and when he wasn't, he did a mix of writing in the room with the, or, you know, developing story in the room with the other writers. And then also he would have to go to all of the production meetings. So it'd be like, you know, talking with costumes, talking with the director of the episode, because that changed every week. And so they sort of had to brief them on what to do. Um, just setting meetings with other various people that they were considering bringing on to the Blackish team in whatever capacity. Um, so it was really, I mean, we did a huge mix of stuff. Um, and it was cool because I really got a crash course in production, which at USC, the writing students have to take a couple of production classes, but you don't really learn, you're not immersed in it like the production students are. Um, so I still had a lot to learn and that really taught me, you know, most of what I needed to know as a writer, because, you know, it's good to be familiar with it, even if you are not constantly like on set. Um, and then we got to interact with, um, or me and the other showrunner's assistant, we also interacted with the other writers and like we were just part of the, the writer's room. We had a floor, <clears throat> excuse me, we had a floor um, in a building at Disney. Um, and so it was just like, it was really fun. Like we felt like we were part of the family. Um, and we also, uh, we got to learn from the younger writers on the staff because they were sort of where we wanted to be. <laughs> you know, a few years from where we were. Uh, so that was really cool. They were all really supportive. Um, and yeah, it was just, it was like the, I have a lot of friends who their first experience in a writer's room is not that great. 
and uh, then they feel discouraged about their career and whatever. I was really lucky that it was a super like just friendly group of people, really diverse too. It was like 50, 50 men and women. It was people of different races. Um, I coming from an office where I was the one person under 45 and the one non-white person. Oh, and the only woman, like it was, so. Like, oh. it was four, it was a small office. It was four of us, it was three men, um, all middle-aged or older, all white. Like I, most of the time it was fine, but sometimes I just would, it was occasionally very exhausting. Um, mm -hmm. So it was nice to be around a group of people that like, you know, understood me a little more and where I come from. Um, so yeah, no, that was, um, that was sort of, oh, and of course, like while I was at Blackish, there were some writers who would be like, send me your script. And so I would get feedback from them, which really helped me, you know, move forward. And being in a comedy room, like before I worked on Blackish, I had only just started dabbling in comedy. And then I got there and I was like, wait, these people get to just like sit in a room and tell jokes for money all day. Like, I want to do that. So um, I got to really get a crash course in um, comedy and I developed my brand of comedy at, during my time on Blackish and beyond, but it started there. <laughs> That's cool. I'm just laughing at that because. Um tell you a funny story when I was um my early 20s and, and I was in school I asked my friends like what do you look for in a guy and one of the first things he always said was a sense of humor and I was like sense of humor I was like why who cares <laughs> and then I met my husband and my husband happens to be extremely funny but alas I do not appreciate the sense of humor he has a very dark sense of humor he likes to make very morbid jokes and I'm like it's not to joke about other people's pain you know anyway so here's the irony I have no sense of humor I have a very funny husband and what you're talking about like being in a kind of room I was like oh I would suck at that <laughs> I'm not funny at all I mean you know you say that but I think a lot of people have um a lot more humor in them than they realize and it just comes out in different ways like I don't consider myself a very funny person just like in conversation but then it's like in my writing I can write a really good joke you know so it whereas there are some people who like they can do stand-up and they can perform and but then if they're writing like narrative it doesn't come out as well and then there are some people who are just blessed and can do all of it and are hilarious and I'm like oh, I hate you but I'm so good <laughs> talking because you're really funny <laughs> I guess I guess you're right. I do like when I do write. Um, it I, it is a sense of humor. Like it's not. It's kind of like subtle cleverness where you're like, huh? Oh, yeah. Like you know, like kind of a little bit poking fun and seeing things in like a new light that, that is funny, a little sarcastic. So that I do have. <laughs> but yeah, that's cool. So yeah, so tell me about the the movie that you were where you're an assistant to the director. And I'm excited to talk about it because I read that book. But I'll let you talk about it first. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. So um, I was the assistant to the director of the upcoming Disney Plus film Cheaper by the Dozen, which is a remake of a remake of a remake, I think. There's been two or three other versions. I should yeah, I remember when I was a teenager, one of them came out with the guy from Superman, because I used to watch Super, no, Clarkville, Smallville. Smallville. It was a Superman. Oh, was he in it? I haven't seen that yeah. movie in so long. I just think of it as the Steve Martin one. But I don't even remember because I, I didn't watch it. I just remember if he was in it. But uh, Peter by the Dozen is something that I read a lot as a kid. So it was just funny that I never watched the film, but I did read it a lot. It was a really great book. It's, it's funny. And the, the father was just hilarious. And I love that, like, you know, anyway. I, so yeah, I'm curious how the, the movie interpretation went. <laughs> yeah, well, and it's based on a true story. I don't know if you knew that, yeah. but it, yeah, it's really, it's kind of cool. But um. So yeah, uh, this iteration was written by Kenya Barris and Jenny, Jenny Henry, who is a writer who's worked on Blackish and Grownish, and she's a good friend of Kenya's. Um, and so they, if you know anything about Kenya Barris, you know his writing is like very, he brings on diverse characters. It's a lot about like the Black experience and the non-white experience. Um, and so for his version, uh, it became a blended family 
uh, of a black mom, a white dad, they each had their own kids from previous marriages and then they come together and they have two sets of twins, which is insane. Um, so, and in our version, there's actually 10 kids and then there's two fur babies. Uh, okay. <laughs> so they count as part of the dozen. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so it was, it was a little different from the past ones. Um, I think Kenya probably steered away from, you know, one set of parents having 12 kids because like that just really doesn't happen that much anymore. Um, I'm from an ultra Orthodox Jewish background and yes, it, over okay. there, it's very, very common. My particular community was a little more like they didn't have 12, but my, my grandma, that's actually whatever. So she's a Holocaust survivor. And both of her parents' kids were, um, in the first marriages, almost all of them were killed. So one of her brothers had 15 kids because um, his parents between them lost 15 kids. So he specifically had 15. So yeah, and, and her community is <clears throat> very common. I grew up where kids had more like eight, eight to 10 kids. Mm -hmm. But yeah, 12 is also normal. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, like, my mom is one of 10 kids and then um she actually has four half siblings as well she's from a very muslim community um but it like even now in that community i think it's less common um but yeah i mean it, it's interesting to hear that because like in a secular in the secular part of America, like you think, oh yeah, people don't have, but then it's like Irish Catholic and Orthodox mm -hmm. Jews. And, you know, um, it's, yeah, it definitely differs. I'm like, now I'm thinking, how would cheaper by the dozen look if it were about an Orthodox Jewish family? That would be interesting. Matching outfits. Where I'm from, <laughs> people are very into matching outfits. Like all the kids will have the same outfit, like sometimes different variations of the same outfit. But it's uh -huh. really cute because you can you walk around and you're like, oh, these kids all belong to that family. Wow. <laughs> all wearing like okay. green or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that I mean, I think of that with like twins. Like the, the youngest set of twins in the cheaper family always have coordinating. They're not ever exactly matching, but it's like they're always somewhat coordinating. Um, mm -hmm. but then something that was really fun with production was Gail, the director, my boss's name is Gail Lerner, by the way. I don't know if I said that. Um, she wanted each of the kids to have their own very distinct sense of style. So, and Kenya is the things that he cares really, I mean, he cares really deeply about every aspect of his stories, which is why he's such a successful producer. But um, two things that he's especially passionate about are fashion and music. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, he and Gail really wanted to make sure that each character had their own distinct sense of style. And they worked with a couple different um, costume designers to achieve those looks, which was like, it was a really cool process to watch them sort of go through and like pull the looks and things like that. That is cool. You know, I'm not like super into fashion myself at all, but I know that whenever my, my mom, bless her heart, she'll always go shopping and she'll always bring me something. She's like, oh, Mindy, like, I love this. This is perfect. And I'm like, Ima, Ima, she's just really I'm like, Ima, this is something that you like. <laughs> like, this is right. your style. Like, oh, I my mom does the same. <laughs> yeah, she's like, oh, I just, I thought of you. And like, we, my sister and I sort of had to, after a while, be like, mom, we love you. But like, you need to stop getting us stuff because it's never stuff that we like. It's like <laughs> once in a blue moon, she'll find something that's like perfect. But then every other time it's like, no, this is something you want to wear. It's not something we want to wear, you know, <laughs> but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess, um, how long was the process of working on a movie? And was it like, I'm curious about like the day-to-day -day aspect of working on it. Was it like nine to five? Is it longer hours? Like how many days, how long? Yeah, so it really depended on um, what part of the process we were in. Uh, I My contract was for about a year, so that, and I was on from pre-production through post-production, so that gives you a sense of roughly how long it took to do uh, pre-production, production, and post-production. Um, so prep was um, a few months at the start of last year, I think it was like two months. Um, and that was doing things like discussing wardrobe and designing the sets and things like that. Um, and then production was 11 weeks, roughly. Uh, 
And during prep, my schedule was hours wise, it was fine in terms of what happened during those hours, it was very packed. So we very rarely went longer than like six or 7 p.m. Like I would get to work at 9, 9.30. No, maybe a little earlier. My boss likes doing stuff early. So like 8.39 and then uh, we'd be there until 6.30 or 7. She has a husband and a kid. So like she wanted to be home uh, for them. So uh, but during the day, we would be, I mean, like there'd be days where we would meet with five different departments back to back just because there's so many decisions that my boss needed to make. Um, and so I was scheduling all of those meetings. I was taking notes. I was coordinating um, all of the information that she needed for those. So it was busy in a way, but it was more like there was just a lot packed into the normal working hours. Um, and then when my schedule got crazy, it was when we started production because production is, I don't know if you heard about uh, the strike that was possibly going to happen at the end of 2021, but basically the uh, IOTC, which is the big uh, film and theater union, um, they were like, among other things, one of their chief concerns were like, was the hours, which is just crazy and turnaround time, which means the time between days of shooting was too short. It was unsafe. Um, so our set was uh, pretty healthy in terms of that. We weren't shooting crazy hours. And uh, a big part of that was because we had so many kids on set. Um, and with kids, you can only shoot a certain number of hours uh, a day, uh, depending on their age. Uh, so we were limited by that. And then it's also, I remember talking with some people on set and they were like, oh yeah, I stay away from like horror movies because so all at night. <laughs> it's a lot of night shoots. Yeah. And you're working from like 5 p.m. to 5 a.m. or whatever, you know. Um, so this movie is a comedy. It, most of it was set during the day, you know. Um, so we did have a lot of locations. So it was like almost 50-50 location and not location. Um, and all of the location was in LA, thankfully. Um, nothing was more than an hour and a half drive maybe, which is very unusual and we were very lucky. Uh, and our sets were, our stages were at Paramount, which is in the middle of Hollywood. So we didn't have to Initially, the movie was going to be shot in like Atlanta or Vancouver, something like that. But uh, then we like won the, there's like a lottery process for which productions get to shoot at studios in Los Angeles. Um, so we won that. So we got to stay, which was very convenient. Um, yeah, the AC is very competitive to get those. <laughs> it is, yeah, because there's just not a lot of space. Um, <laughs> so it, you know, luckily we didn't have to travel anywhere uh, and it, but like the location days, you know, you would get off work and then you would have to drive an hour and a half back home. Um, so they were, I would say I was waking up probably at like five, between 5.30 and 6.30 most days during production. Um, a little later when we were on set at Paramount, um, because I live closer to there. Uh, and then I'd often not get home until like 10 p.m. maybe. So long hours. I got paid overtime, which was nice. Um, but yeah, very long hours. Uh, I was on set almost every, I can think of maybe like two or three days when I wasn't on set because my boss had other things for me to do. But I was there near her while she was directing. Because of COVID, I couldn't be like right next to her because uh, there were very strict guidelines that we had to adhere to, but I was on set nearby in case she needed anything. Um, I would help her with, you know, she had to sort of rewrite a line of dialogue or alter something like a prop or something like that. I would help her by running to the props person and asking them for whatever. Um, and she did have meetings during production, which not as many as prep, but I would have to sort of be her little like 
all right, Gail, come on, we gotta go. Yeah, I know, I know you're talking to, you gotta, so there was a lot of like sort of shepherding her around from place to place, making sure she was where she needed to be at all times. Um, but it was really fun, it was cool. And I got to um, spend a lot of time with people on set and some of the cast, which there were out of the 10 kids, eight of them were minors. Um, and the two that weren't were like, 19 so it was a bunch of kids and they were like the most well-behaved kids I've ever met like it was so I was expecting chaos mm -hmm. and like yeah the younger ones were definitely quite energetic but overall they were just so lovely and I think my boss loves kids so I think it was just like paradise for her to get to work with them all the time and she really tried to create an environment on set that was like very calm and like it's okay we're not like doing anything crazy here there aren't literal fires to put out hopefully like we're not curing cancer let's just have a good time and make a movie and yeah so um it was a really nice working environment um and so even though it was long hours it wasn't I never like resented it because I was having a good time and I was learning a lot. Um, and then once we got into post-production, uh, it slowed down a bit. Uh, the hours would sometimes be weird just because like, if we were doing a preview screening, I would have to work on the weekend because that's when the screenings are. But um, it was, I was just helping her coordinate things in the post process. Like for instance, we had outside vendors, we had like the special effects people and the people who created our credit sequence, things like that. So I did a lot of coordinating. Um, with that and I have seen this movie so many times now <laughs> like in so many different I've seen so many different cuts of it um but again it was really cool to watch the process and everybody in the cutting room was really cool and that was part of the process I really like post-production because that's sort of the last place where you get to alter the story if you need to um and I uh learned so much because it's something I'd enjoyed, but I hadn't learned that much about before, but I was literally, my office was in the cutting room for this movie. So um, I just got to observe so much, which was really fun. So, and that took us up until the end of 2021. And then for the past month and a half, it's just been marketing meetings and stuff, which I haven't really been involved in because there's not that much for me to do. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we're premiering on Disney Plus on the 18th of March. It's going to be streaming. We we wish we could do a theatrical release because I think during COVID they were like, oh yeah, we'll just do streaming because we're not going to be able to do theatrical. And then like now things are better. People are going to movies and the movie, like it's getting really good uh, feedback from everybody who's seen it. So we're like, oh, we wish we could do theaters. But uh, the nice thing is you can just watch it from your couch in your living room. So that's, uh, going to be coming out soon. And we're all very excited for that. And so now I'm just helping with like the premiere. Uh, we are actually doing like a physical premiere for it. Uh, so I'm helping out with coordinating that a little bit. Nice. So yeah, we have Disney Plus and my kids, uh, watch it. So we'll watch it together with my kids. And I'll tell them Yay, how, yeah, like, oh, look, look at how what are your kids' ages? They're 10 and 9. Oh, okay. That's the perfect age. Yeah, yeah, it's a comedy really that they're probably gonna love it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's really fun. It's a really sweet story. Um, and yeah, just all of the kids shine. And um, Zach Braff is the dad, and Gabrielle Union is the mom. Uh, and they're just both so lovely as well. Like everybody that was cast, just they just did a really great job. So I mean, obviously I'm biased, but uh, <laughs> it was it was so fun to make, and so I hope people have fun watching it too. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward. So did you go straight from that to Big Ethel Energy? Or <clears throat> was there anything else in between that you want to talk about before we get to Big Ethel Energy? Um, well, let me take a sip of tea. I actually started Big Ethel um, before I started on... So the process of Big Ethel started in like spring of 2020. Um, I was visiting my parents during the pandemic because I wasn't working full time and any work I was doing could be remote. Uh, so I stayed with them for like, I would say like two and a half months. Um, and 
while I was there, I got a call from a woman that I went to film school with and she said, hey, I work for Webtoon, I'm a producer. Uh, we're about to partner with a few different uh, comics publishers. Do you wanna pitch something for DC Comics? And I was like, sure, yeah, cool, why not? Um, and then I sat down to like kind of pitch or like come up with an idea and I couldn't really think of anything. I also just realized like I'm getting into the big FL story, but is that okay? Like I, I'm just going to tell yeah. you the timeline. Yeah, good. Um, yeah. So, but yes, to answer your question, big FL started before cheaper. Uh, and I was working on it. It's like my weekends for the past year have been big FL and my weekdays have been cheaper. That's sort of how it's gone. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so I sat down to like come up with a pitch because of course, if my friend says pitch something for DC and Webtoon, like you're going to say yes, right? But did you, did you read Webtoons before you started doing this? I didn't even know what Webtoon was. <laughs> I like, I was very, um, I like, I knew that sites like this existed. And I think I had heard of certain webtoon comics, like specific ones, but I didn't realize that they were webtoon related. Um, and then once I got into it, I was like, oh, this is the thing that people keep talking about that I just like haven't ever looked at, you know? Um, I tend to, I really don't like spending a lot of time on my phone. So I think that's probably part of it. Um, but I'm very I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah, it's, 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 trying to keep track of my like social media habits. And yeah, yeah stuff, I know. <laughs> I mean, I definitely find myself sometimes getting more into it. Like now with Big Ethel, like trying to promote it, I spend much more time on Instagram, which like, yeah, it's good for me and for the series. But I also just, yeah, I really don't like being on my phone. I, I don't know why I'm just I'd rather just not, you know? So I think that's why I, I, there's a, I mean, there's a lot of apps that like my friends talk about that I just don't really, or it's like, I've heard of them, but I've never used them. I'm just, eh, I'd rather like watch TV or read a book or play with my cat or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so, uh, so I was trying to come up with a pitch for DC, but the thing is like, I've never written superhero stuff I've never written anything like supernatural like I just could not think of something that I felt would you know fit under that umbrella and so I contacted her and I was like hey like I really want to pitch something but I really feel like my content isn't right for DC um I mean do you still want me to pitch something that just might not quite and she was like well Archie Comics is taking one pitch from somebody. Um, do you want to do that one? And I, my like eyes like lit up. I, when I was a kid, I read so much Archie. It was, people thought I was really into comics mm -hmm. because I read so much Archie, but really I was just into Archie. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know that much about Marvel or DC. I just like, I love the Archie universe so much. So anyway, I was like, yes, perfect. I can do that. Um, and so that's sort of when I came up with the Ethel idea. I pitched that to her and the head of Webtoon. Um, and then they liked it. They took it to Archie. They approved of it. We got the ball rolling. Um, so I would say I started writing scripts um, in the fall of 2020. Um, and then I was writing, I was just like stacking scripts for a while. And then, and they were looking for, uh, their main artist and, you know, the artistic team. Uh, and so we, they started on art in, I want to say March of 2021. And from that point on, it was, you know, there was a whole cycle of production where they were working on art. I was writing a future episode um, and it's been kind of a well-oiled machine since then. And then we premiered in September of 2021. Nice. So how does, how does it work now? Do you write um, the script that is like published that week or do you have, I mean, how many episodes in advance do you have? Um, so to give you an idea, I think this week, the episode that came out like for everybody on Webtoon was 
26 and the fast pass episode was 31. Um, this week I turned in the script for episode 47. Okay. So I'm like 15 ahead roughly. Um, and it's been really interesting to see the artistic process from start to finish because like, I'm not, I can't draw. I can't like, I, it's, that's just not my wheelhouse at all. Um, so seeing how that works has been really illuminating. And it also helps me be a better writer for this series because I know, you know, what they need, what's difficult for them, how long things take. Uh, so I can sort of tailor my scenes to, and the imagery and stuff to what they need. Cool. And what's it like to see the characters drawn out? Like, did you, do you have a hard time, you know, picturing, okay, like connecting the characters in from your script to the characters that you saw? Or was it like, you're like, okay, this is them? Um, for the most part, because most of them are existing characters within the Archie universe. Um, it's pretty straightforward from what I write to what's drawn. Um, I do think that there, Siobhan is our artist and her style is definitely quite different from most of the art in the Archie universe. So um, it's sort of as if the Archie characters have gone through the Siobhan filter and they are a bit different, but like they still have the same essence. And I definitely try to keep them uh, accurate in terms of like the way they talk and the things that they do. Um, but it's been really cool to see her interpretation of those characters that I know and love from like the old school Archie, which is mu much more like Western cartoonish um simple drawings and then of course when she like I've gotten to create some characters from scratch and so it's really cool to just like visualize these people in my head like write out a description and then she comes up with something and it's like she does such a good job it, she just always hits it out of the park so they're all beautiful they're all like they're just beautiful beautiful characters and oh, she, I mean, there's a, I think it's in her, in her, like, artist description that, like, somebody once told her to stop making everybody so beautiful, and she was like, I can't, um, and, like, you know, honestly, for me, I'm a little, I would, like, slightly more realism in the art, like, I would love, because it talks about body image and things like that, like, I really would love to see a bit more body diversity, a bit less like just airbrushed, you know, but I also have learned and, and realized that like comics, this is how comics work. Like they're impressionistic. It's not going to be like a, a realism situation. Quite, I mean, I, there are comics that are like that, but in this case, because this is like sort of a feel good, mm -hmm. uh, just like cute story, uh, the art that she does is it's really perfect for the story, I think. You know, I, I remember I told you before we started that it always calms me down. I just realized, I think, why the, the color palette that she uses mm -hmm. always just has very soothing colors. Like the Archie comics, okay, I'm, I'm not an artist, but so let's see how, how well I can describe it. But the, the original Archie comics are like very, um, like the primary colors, they're very bright. Mm -hmm. And she yeah. uses, I don't know, like muted colors, like mm -hmm. orange and purple and green and like very, they're just like the suiting versions of colors <laughs> is my very eloquent explanation. <laughs> totally. Yeah, no, I definitely feel the same way. Um, and uh, in that way, that's actually, I think, one of the things that made it feel more contemporary and uh, connected to reality in a way than the really bright primary color palette of old school Archie. Um, so that change I thought was like really perfect for a story that's a bit more like serialized and uh, goes deeper into the emotions and isn't just like wham, bam, joke, blah, blah, blah. Like, it, which is what old school Archie, like they're very short little comics that are sort of fun and jokey, but there isn't a lot of character development. So, right. yeah. You know, I actually, um, Archie Comics was also one of the only, probably the only comics I read as a kid too. I read that and I read Magical Pokemon Journeys, which I don't know, I don't think it's a comic, I guess. It was probably 
Manga or something. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I bet my neighbor across the street used to get them. So whenever I'd go to her house, I would just read all of them. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. So you were saying before about like the messages about body image you can. So I've noticed you have um, actually a lot of messages in in your in your stories, and sometimes it's like you know message of the week kind of uh, feel. So I like it, and you know I, I'd love to hear more about your thought process and how you incorporate that into your writing, and whether it's something that you always had in advance or it just comes out naturally. Um, yeah, so I think it's kind of a mix of both of those, uh, overall as a writer, I, one of my goals is to, uh, incorporate or just like in, have visibility for groups that have been marginalized. Like for me as a woman, as a black woman, as a woman from a Muslim family, like there's a, as a woman with uh, mental health issues. Like there's just so much about me that doesn't fit into boxes and especially not the boxes that most people fit into or that the media wants us to think most people fit into. Um, it's always been very important for me to show a different perspective, um, than readers might have been exposed to before. Uh, and so anything I write, I try to incorporate that. Um, and then in this one, in this story in particular, body image seemed like the natural choice because I think body image was the natural choice because Ethel, for a long time in the comics, she was, her nickname was Big Ethel. Um, and in the original Archie comics, it's not about her weight, it's about how tall she is. She's like as tall as the boy, she's very spindly, um, you know, kind of a beanpole, uh, doesn't have that womanly figure that Veronica and Betty have. Um, and so I wanted to bring that back, but sort of expand it pun unintended, uh, to uh, weight as well, because sizeism is such a big, again, these puns are just coming out, such a big <laughs> issue that like people really, it's very socially acceptable to uh, make like fat phobic comments and to uh, talk about your body or other people's bodies in a way that like we really shouldn't. And I think just in the past like five to 10 years, it's become slightly more mainstream for people to like be body diversity activists and really speak out about this message, which I really appreciate because I, I you can't see because of Zoom, but I'm 5'9", so I'm fairly tall um, and I'm not thin and I never have been. And so, and there have been times in my life where I've felt less than in some way because of the way I looked. It also, I mean, for me, it didn't help that like I grew up in a pretty white area and I'm only, I'm, my dad's white, my mom's black. Um, so I look different in so many ways. Um, and I just, especially because Webtoon is so many of the readers are young. I just, I really feel a responsibility to tell young people that like, it doesn't like you can look however you look and there's nothing wrong with it because I think I really like a lot of the messages that I put into uh this story are things that I think I really needed to hear when I was younger um mm. and some of them I still need to hear like there's definitely it's been a very therapeutic process and like you'll you'll keep reading as the episodes come out and like it to me it's very obvious that a lot of the things I am writing about in it are uh things that I've been thinking about a lot, uh, emotionally myself. Um, but I also know that a lot of women, especially think about these things in relationships and with body image and all of these various subjects. Um, so yeah, it, you know, it, I, I definitely don't think of it as like a message of the week situation, but that is sort of how it shapes up. Um, but I do, in general, try to uh, include, I, so I can't remember the way this was phrased, but I had, I took French all through grade school, and one of my, when I was in a French literature class, we were reading like Moliere, um, and uh, there's another, there's a couple other 
like classic French uh, dramatists. And uh, my teacher was like, this one wrote their stories the way the world is currently. Mm -hmm. And this one wrote their stories the way they wanted to see the world and the way that they wanted the world to be. And so I've always thought of it. I, I sort of categorize writing into mm -hmm. those two. And there, I think there was another category, but I don't remember that one. Um, might have just been like nihilism or something. <laughs> but um, but uh, so I tend to write the way I want to see the world. And often I'll start out with a base of what it is now, but I quickly evolve into the way I want to see things because I think like leading by example is very important. Um, so I do think that in this comic series, my writing does sometimes come off pretty heavy handed, but I, another thing, another reason that I, well, I should say one of the reasons that I don't mind that so much is because growing up reading Archie, even just the, the stories that were, you know, six comic book pages long, a lot of them did have some sort of message that was pretty obvious and straightforward, but it didn't feel preachy. It was just like, this is how you should treat people, or this is what, if you treat people terribly, you might get a comeuppance like Reggie does or things like that, you know? Um, so I felt like in a comic, it's sort of, that's the format to be slightly more heavy handed with a message. Um, and especially because Ethel, I think, I mean, my goal is it's like a feel good um, series. So yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't mind it that much, but I do think a lot about like, yeah, this, the way I write Ethel in terms of the messages, I definitely wouldn't ever be that obvious with them in my screenwriting, mm -hmm. but somehow in the comics, it feels more appropriate. Yeah, it, it, you know, I agree with you. I know um, I've read a couple books on, on uh, story writing and one of the things, um, have you ever read Robert McKee's book, Stories? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's it's ringing a bell. I haven't been in school in a very long time, but unless it came out recently, I want to say I probably read parts of it for school. Yeah, it's it was not recent. He came out with another book, Dialogue, more recently, I think, but his first book, okay. is, I think, has been out for a while. So one of the things he, he writes that made a big impression on me was that when you write a story, um, you have to trust your reader's intelligence and in the sense that when they look out of the world, they have different events happening and they assign meaning to the events and they thread it together into a story that has meaning like, you know, oh, this is the A, the B, the C part. Um, so yeah, so he says, you know, don't be like, don't do it for them, let them do it. So in general, I also didn't think that, but also with the comic, I'm like, it, it doesn't bother me at all. It's just like, oh, it, it is very lighthearted and it's nice, you know? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Awesome. Yeah. And I, I also think like, you know, when you're writing for a younger audience too, like you don't have to be quite as subtle with things. Um, and I think that as a teenager, the storylines that weren't quite as subtle were actually the ones that I really picked up on and appreciated because it was very obvious what they were trying to say. And it was something that I really needed to hear at that time in my life. So the, the things that I try to include in Ethel are things that um, I think readers could benefit from hearing even if they are like very explicitly written out as opposed to like much more subtly woven in you know right so now I guess just a bit of a practical question about how it works so how long does it take you like to write an episode and um have you like how what was the approval process for the story like did, when you pitched the story did you tell them like you know beginning to end kind of thing and then they were like oh we don't have to see the chapters you just write it how does that work uh so I initially wrote a um, sort of a series overview with some character, like I did a big character bio for Ethel as she would appear in my series um, and a few other characters that went to Webtoon, then it went to Archie. Um, and then I did a, a few calls with the head of w Webtoon in um, like the American head of Webtoon, I guess, um, the creative officer, I'm assuming is his title. Uh, and so we sort of went through and like refined some things about the story. And he gave me some really good ideas and also 
helped me sort of shape it more into a webtoon friendly format. Um, Mm -hmm. And then once I got assigned, so Archie approved of that. And then I got assigned a producer from Webtoon to work with. um, And she's amazing. She like knows everything about the process and she oversees everything. So she's sort of my like guiding hand um, because I haven't written comics before now. Um, Sarah, I think I was reading about it. Sarah Wong, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. so um, she uh, has been really helpful. And when I started it, so... The nice thing is the the format that I write the scripts in, we call them scripts, is not that far removed from writing a screenplay. Um, I actually use the same software. I use Final Draft to write both my scripts and the scripts for Archie. Um, it's just instead of dividing it by scenes, you, you uh, divide it by panel. Mm-hmm. So there was definitely a learning curve there, but Sarah was really helpful. And, uh, you know, she showed me some examples of other, and also, so the, the woman that initially brought me on that I went to school with, her name is Quinn Sosna Spear. Um, and she's another producer at Webtoon. So she also helped me because for her, like, she really understood the whole, the transitioning from writing scripts to writing comics. So, Anyway, I had a lot of help um, and the way, so the episodes are typically between 60 and 80 panels, usually closer to 60. um, And I write an episode a week. Mm -hmm. Uh, It usually takes me, like I can do it in a day. It's not like it takes me the full week to write it. Um, I don't know about other uh, Webtoon writers though. You know, that might just be my pace, but um, it usually comes out to like, I don't know, like, 14 pages on average in final draft. Um, And so, yeah, so I write that, I turn it in um, and then that goes to the, well, so then my producer reads over it. She gives me notes, we tweak it. And then, um, so where, where the Archie team comes in is at the beginning of the, process uh before I started writing scripts I had to write a kind of a series outline like I mentioned before and then an expanded series outline or a season outline and that one Sarah suggested I broke into quadrants so we had sort of phase one phase two phase three phase four and that was to be the whole season of the um series and so it would be all of, all of the main storylines would be included in that uh, outline. Uh, so, you know, you've got your like Ethel, Moose, Seth and Betty in the nursery. I am so close, by the way. Moose is a doll. He's oh my God, so he's nice. I love him. <laughs> um, you know, so all of those were described in the outline. So the Archie team knew where I was taking the story from start to end of the season. Then they gave me their feedback. I tweaked the outline based on their feedback, sent it back, they approved it, and then we got started on scripts. Um, And the way I work is roughly every 10 episodes, I'll do a more detailed outline that goes episode by episode. Um, Mm -hmm. So there have been some changes from the initial outline plan that we came up with, but like Nothing too drastic uh, because, I mean, I can, maybe there's been one or two things, but, you know, we we need to run any big changes by the Archie team. Um, so we try to keep to what they initially approved, but like episode by episode, um, I can pretty much do what I want. And then once they're, once Sarah's helped me refine them, the Archie people will look them over, but like they really don't have, they're not very uh, involved in, like they're not very controlling at all. That's the word I'm looking for. So they really let us do what we want, which is really nice. Um, And they sort of, yeah, I I don't 
think that there's really been anything where they've been like, no, you need to rewrite this episode or things like that, um, which has been really nice. So then it goes to art and it goes through the whole art process, um, which takes many weeks, I would say maybe a month from script to finished product, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, because I don't really... I always look through the different stages and like, if there's tweaks that I want them to make, I will let them know, but I don't supervise the art team. That's Sarah's job. So, you know, it's, I can look at them. I don't have to, I do because I, I like to know where my story is going once it's been transformed into the visuals. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah. You know, I read, um, a lot of webtoon stories, obviously, and most of them are um, kind of like writer artist combo, so that there's one person doing both, and they have you know people helping them normally. But so it's interesting to see how it, it's different when there's you know a different person for each of those. Right, and that's something that they I think have sort of. I think when they started, it was a lot of like artists who also wrote their stories. And now they're expanding their teams and, you know, bringing on people with different disciplines. So there's a writer who's just the writer and then the artist. And then there's like, there's, you know, when you were talking about the colors there, we actually have a couple of different colorists and we have like a backgrounds guy. And there's like so many steps. I, you know, I guess if I had thought about it, I could have you know, assumed a few of them, but there's a lot of different steps of the art to go through. And it's really fun to look at the evolution of, you know, the each panel as it goes through the stages. That's pretty cool. Um, I get the um, artwork from Webtoons for, for use in like my cover art for when they do the podcast. And I once got, usually I just asked for the JPEG file, <clears throat> but I once got like the Photoshop file and I was looking through it and I was like, oh, I don't have Photoshop, so I just downloaded it for, for like a free trial. And I was looking at all the layers. And I was like, wow. And I was like, it's so cool to see all the layers that, you know, go into making this, this piece of art. And it's obviously a ton of work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, man, they just really work so hard on it. I like the amount of labor that goes into it. It's kind of, I mean, it's the same with coming from a film background. I liken it to animation. Like on animation, there's a huge team uh, mm -hmm. that works on stuff and it's just it's really cool to see all of the components come together to sort of make this finished product that looks really unified and clean at the end yeah oh, it's beautiful thank you so much for making it it's one of the, the things I really enjoy so I want to just tell you a personal thank you for, for writing the story and I'm very curious <laughs> I'm, I'm hope I'm rooting for Moose but I know there's a lot of like romantic pathways that you know can be embarked upon. So I'm oh, you will you will enjoy <laughs> the rest of the season. I think I'm curious. You'll have to like keep in touch and tell me what you think as it continues. But uh, there's there's definitely many things for you to look forward to. Um, and you know the season's only halfway through in terms of what's been posted on Webtoon. So there's mm -hmm. a lot left. Yeah, and I'm curious to see more of Jughead because. We're kind of like he's like always being hinted at and we just haven't gotten like a full grip on him yet so mm -hmm. i'm curious like when we finally get that like jughead you know what's going on with him <laughs> mm -hmm. that is the big question mark of the season <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i definitely will keep the touch and let you know um so yeah it's just the last couple questions about um creativity and how it is to work with that because one of the things i personally wonder is like when you work in a creative field does that sometimes take away the joy of working creatively? Does it become a drag or like, do you still have that spark? Like, how does that work? Does it sometimes become hard to be creative? That's a really good question. Um, and so when I was talking earlier about film school and how a lot of it is therapy, mm -hmm. um, a lot of it is also, uh, at least at USC, this is not really the case at NYU from what I know, but at USC, the ethos there or whatever is like, this is a business and you are, we're preparing you to go into a business to create a product that you will exchange for money because that's mm -hmm. capitalism. Um, and yes, it's creative, but like, we want you guys to go out there and make a living. 
you know? Um, so it's very practical, sometimes a little too practical in terms of, uh, you know, what stories you should write or um, the steps you take to sort of get your foot in the door. Um, I mean, that's not to say that they have literally like a checklist, but, you know, it's, <laughs> it, they focus on, they teach you how to carry yourself in the industry. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things that they also teach you is like, if you're doing this as a job, you, you have to keep creating, like that's just, they're married. It's not, mm -hmm. so for me, creativity is not, um, it, it is my job. So because I'm, and like, I, I get what you're asking. I've been very lucky in that so far, I have really only worked on projects that I'm really enthusiastic about and really love. Like if one day, and you know, I hope that in my career, I have enough um, options that I can pick something that I really love working on because I don't want to be stuck writing stuff. If I'm not passionate about what I'm writing, like that's, I'm probably not the right person for the job, you know? Um, so yes, there is, you know, a bit of like, yeah, this is for Webtoon, for instance, like it's a job I get paid. I have to, um, you know, and they're not like monsters if I'm sick or something, like I can take a week off. That's fine. But like, you know, I have to create a product once a week. I get paid for it. Um, and I would say having a, like, honestly, getting paid is a great motivator for mm -hmm. being creative, at least for me, because I need to pay rent, um, and take care of my cat. So, um, it, you know, I just, I find ways to do it. But as I was saying earlier, uh, working on my personal portfolio, because I haven't been, I'm not, you know, Disney for, I don't have a deal with a studio. Disney isn't asking me for pilots, things like that. So, uh, because it's just me, that can be a little harder. Um, and on the one hand, it's like, yeah, I can be way more creative with the pilots that the TV pilot, I write TV, as I said, like, um, the pilots that I write for my personal portfolio, I can be as creative as I want. Um, once you are, once you've signed a contract, you're working on a specific story. So like when I write Ethel, I have to write within the confines of Ethel. Obviously that's just logical sense. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think for me, I find that like my life is steeped in writing enough in general that like I can, I have my creative outlets that are not for money and I can go whichever way I want. And then I have the things that I'm doing that I get paid for, which I'm also very proud of because like it, you know, it, it was a long journey for me from just wanting to do this as a career to being able to make it happen. Um, so I'm still at the stage where like, and I, you know, I hope I actually never, never get out of this stage. I'm still thrilled every time somebody is like, I want to hire you to do something like involving your writing. You know, it's, it's an awesome feeling. And thankfully I've talked to many very successful writers who say that feeling really doesn't wow. go away. Um, so I'm looking forward to that, but yeah, it is just, even if it is for a job and you are getting paid and you have, um, parameters that you have to work in, it's still just, it's so fun. It's like, I get to do, I get to work with words all day, which is my favorite thing. Like, I just love language so much. Oh, that's nice. I, I write poetry, and for me, like, the way I describe it is just beautiful words, you know? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, and, like, we were talking about comedy before, and the thing that I love most about comedy is the manipulation of language mm -hmm. to uh, elicit that, you know, response from people. Uh, and I just, yeah, I just, I love language so much. It's fun. My mom's a reading teacher, so, like, I've been very oh. aware <laughs> of language from a very young age, and, uh, it, I don't know, there's just, there's something about it that to me is like, great. It's so simple, but it's, it's the best. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. It's like, you know, for me, like, I, I feel like I'm rambling, but I'm just like, yeah, like, of course, like, it's, I don't know, just to be able to do that as a career, like that doesn't take away from my creativity. Um, it sort of adds to it because like, it, you know, it's not like I'm doing one thing during the day. And then I, I mean, obviously when I'm an assistant, yes, but it's still in, um, 
sort of the the same path and uh yeah it doesn't feel like oh this is something i have to do like in the in the cover of darkness and whatever it's like no i just get to do it all the time and it's awesome and actually working with parameters to me is very fun mm -hmm. um so i really like writing like i want to write for network television um because which is saying that is a little like it's kind of dying out but it's also kind of network comedies are having a bit of a resurgence i think um I really like it because there are pretty strict parameters, you know, like you have to have act breaks at certain points for commercials because that's how studios are funded or networks are funded, excuse me. And, um, you know, you can't curse. You gotta, like, there's certain, depending on the time that it airs, there's, you know, certain levels of like raunchiness that you can have and things like that. And some people really hate that, but I think it's fun. It's just like an extra challenge. Um, and it's not like everything I write, like if I had to do that with everything, I think it would probably be a little like, uh, you know, I would feel slightly confined, but, um, you know, when you get to write as much as I do, I think it is fun to have some things where it's like, no, this time you have to do it this way. And this time you get to do it this way. It's like that. Yes, yeah, so that actually leads into another question I want to ask you, um, what projects do you want to do in the future? Or like, what do you hope to get out there in the world? And you mentioned you were writing, you know, your own pilots or whatever. So I'd love to hear about that. Yeah. Um, so in addition to Webtoon, which like I would love to write another Webtoon in the future, um, I am, I keep meaning to get in touch with my friend who initially brought me on and just be like, hey, like, you know, I, I'd be down to write something else. Um, but uh I also, so as I said, sort of at the beginning, I recently figured out a new pilot idea that I'm feeling pretty confident about. So right now I'm working out the beats of that story. That's a half hour comedy. Um, and this one would be, I think for streaming. So it'll probably be more like 35 to 40 pages, which is a little longer than what a network script would be. Um, but yeah, so that's what I'm working on. Um, and then Ethel, and then I'm helping my boss with her writing. She's doing a number of things right now. Um, and that's fun because she really lets me, she like trusts me creatively. So she lets me like give her notes and pitch jokes and things like that. Um, so those are, I mean, those are the main things now. My goal is to uh, get staffed as a writer on a TV show. Um, so I am working towards that at the same time. And honestly, it's like, when you want to be a TV writer, like everything you do sort of has to be in service of that. So, um, all of the things I'm doing now are just helping me get to that stage. Okay, cool. Um, so what advice do you have for people who want to work in the creative field? And you, you know, you're doing, I guess, a few different ones, but yeah, what about any advice that you have would be great? Uh, whatever you are creating whether it's like films or comics or scripts or poems like um you just you can't just like do one thing and then sort of rest on your laurels like you have to keep creating um because not only is it important to have a variety of products to creative products to like share with people but also the more you do it the better you get at it so like when I was in school, it, you know, because school was broken down by semesters, we would like either spend a semester or two semesters on a project and it would be a very long time and we would just be like continually evolving these scripts and changing things and like hacking away. Um, but when I left school, I realized like I can't just have one project that I continually like refine and refine and refine. At a certain point, you have to move on and you have to say like, this is presentable. There are things I would change. There's always going to be something like creative people are, a lot of us are perfectionists in, or we strive for an ideal in our head that like, there's always going to be some practical hiccup, right? So you can keep working on one thing forever, but it's actually, in my opinion, it's really good to continue working on stuff, uh, on new projects, because 
it's practice and, you know, practice is really important for, um, for creative fields where it's less about, you know, like reading a textbook and learning skills. It's more a feeling and feeling your way through your storytelling or, you know, your filmmaking or art, whatever it is. Cool. Okay. Yeah. I like that, you know, actually doing it, doing things. Yeah, exactly. Like you, so my thesis advisor in college, uh, his phrase that he always used was, it's all about butts in seats. Like you just got to put your butt in your seat and do the thing. Um, because you can't call yourself a writer if you don't write, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's something I'm kind of struggling with. But anyway, <laughs> um, I've always wanted to write since I was a kid and I don't really write. So I've kind of done a bunch of like maybe some ancillary things besides for poetry. I do write poetry, but yeah, I haven't really write. Um, anyway, that's my little struggle. But um, last question before we get to the, the rapid fire questions, which mm -hmm. stories do you personally follow? Whether it's, you know, books, TV, webtoons, whatever, like what story do you read? So oh, yeah, sorry, I, you watch. yeah, 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 no, I figured. Um, I watch a lot of TV, like probably too much, but I like, I justify it because I need to like keep up with television for my job. So there's a reason I watch a lot of TV. Um, I, let's see right now, I just watched Archive 81 um, on Netflix and that was really fun. Uh, and then uh, aside from TV and movies, I also love movies. Like I started in movies and then I sort of switched to writing TV, but um, I've always loved movies. I also, as so back to the creative question, if you want to be a writer, you have to read a lot, you know? So like I am, I just, I love books. I love reading. It's like my favorite thing to do. I'm constantly reading like three different things. Um, so that's probably my primary thing that I'm just always doing. Um, and then books and TV, I would say. Uh, and then in terms of Webtoon, I can't say I read a ton of Webtoons because I, as I said earlier, I don't really like being on my phone. Uh, but there is one that's like hands down my absolute favorite. And it's actually, I think it's a canvas Webtoon. Um, it's called Four, I think it's called Four Panel Horror Stories. And it's like, it's literally just, it's, it's cool because it's like, it looks like a woodcut, um, instead of, you know, like Ethel looks drawn with a pen. Um, and it's just four panels and there's not necessarily dialogue, but it's just like this guy, it's so funny and like creepy and just very beautifully crafted. Um, I think his name is Carl Kwasny. Like uh, and yeah, four panel horror stories, I think is what it's called. I can confirm that right now. Let's see. Yeah, okay, I see it. Oh, you found it? Okay, good. Four panel horror comics? Yeah, yes, Carl Kwasny. panel horror comics. Exactly. Carl Kwasny. Highly recommend. It's just so lovely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll check it out. I'll probably link it also in the in the description. Oh yeah, please do. Like, I definitely want more people to see his stuff because it's just it's so fun and like and it's you know it's quick to look at. Uh, it's just kind of like I don't know. It just like makes my day every time a new one comes on. I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll check it out. Even though horror is not my thing, but I will give it a shot. <laughs> It's like, you know, a lot of them are like slightly creepy, but also very funny. They're like kind of tongue in cheek. So yeah. Sounds good. All right. So rapid fire questions, just fun questions. What's your favorite food? Uh, my favorite type of cuisine is probably Vietnamese food. I love pho and boon and bami, mi, all of it. So good. <laughs> I, I grew up in on your face. I could tell you like it. <laughs> yeah, it's, oh, I love it. I, so I grew up in Northern Virginia and the town I grew up in was the Korea town of the DC area. Mm -hmm. So, and it, there was a, even though it's Korea town, there was also a really big Vietnamese population. So I had a lot of Korean food and Vietnamese food growing up. And for some reason, I just gravitated towards the Vietnamese food. Wait, did you grow up in Alexandria? I think I, when I Googled you before, um, yeah, so yeah. the the actual town is Annandale, but a lot of people haven't heard of that unless they're from that area. So I say Alexandria. I went to high school in Alexandria. It was the next town over, um, and more people recognize that. But the town is called Annandale. Okay, 
Okay, so we, yeah, my brother lives in North Carolina, and so we we went to visit him, and our car we went, you know, we visited George Washington's house and all that stuff. Anyway, our car, um, whatever, had, we we struck a pothole, the struts ripped, oh, no. and we had an emergency fix in Alexandria. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, yeah. There's a very nice mechanics there. Um, Bradham Automobile Automotive. So please, they rescued us. Um, if you're there, you can use them. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, I love I love Alexandria. I love Northern Virginia. Like I really miss weather. I live in LA, and like we just don't have much. It's just hot or hotter. Um, and if there were a film industry in the DC area, I would probably go back there. Like I just I I miss it. I love it a lot. Nice. Yeah, it was pretty sound. So, okay, first concert that you went to. So, I think the first concert I went to uh, was Ben Folds. Oh, um, nice. Yeah, in Virginia when I was like, like my sister took me to it. She's older, so you know a lot of my musical tastes are mm -hmm. influenced by her. So she took me to a Ben Folds concert when I was I don't know twelve or something. That's sweet. I used to watch um, the sing off, and he was one of the judges there. It's an acapella. Oh, cool. I didn't know that. That's I awesome. loved it. Yeah, and he's, it's not on he's anymore. In North Carolina, actually. Oh, cool. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> All right. Um, what book are you reading right this moment? So, as I said, I'm usually reading like three, but uh, the one that I was reading this morning is called Goblin by Josh Mallerman. Uh, it's really fun. It's sort of like a creepy fantasy-ish um, set of novellas, novellas that are all set in a town called Goblin. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's very Stephen King-esque so far. I'm only like a third of the way in, but I'm liking it so far. Okay, cool. And most recent song that you listen to? Yesterday, I listened to a song called The Littlest Birds by the Be Good Tanyas, which I hadn't listened to in a very long time, but there was a line from it that was stuck in my head. So I like Googled the line. I was like, what song was that again? And it came up and I listened to it. So yeah. Okay, cool. I haven't heard of it, but I'll check it out. And most recent Google search. Uh, I don't know, but it was probably looking up a synonym for a word because I use the, the, the thesaurus constantly as a writer. Um, highly recommend. I mean, don't use words without knowing what they mean. Because <laughs> so when I was in high school, my English teacher told me that a few years back, she had had a student who clearly like right clicked in word and did word replacement because they were writing something about the Nazi party oh, and it no. changed the Nazi festivities. Hilarious. <laughs> I was like, uh -oh. um, but yes, I love the thesaurus. It's um, if you know how to use it, it's wonderful. So I just I look up synonyms constantly. So probably my last Google search was something of the sort. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna go down here and tell my husband that story because that's hilarious. <laughs> yes, Nazi festivities. I like, I just can't. But yes, I if I I, I Right now I'm not, but I used to tutor uh, writing and English and I would often tell that story because it's just like, you know, oh. don't, don't use words without knowing what they mean. <laughs> yes. Or, or phrases. Um, yeah. So I guess I have another story. My, um, when my husband was in Israel studying, so one of his friends was also American and um, this guy, just random guy, like got into an argument with him and um, my husband's friend was like, he wanted to tell him, um, do you want beef in, in you know, English? So he was like, oh, I want to best sell. But the Israeli guy was like confused because it's not a, an expression in Hebrew. He was like, why are you asking me if I want meat? Like, and then the argument just dissipated. <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah, things can definitely get lost in translation. That's for sure. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. This was so interesting. I, I loved hearing about everything that you've done and, you know, from like people by the dozen and webtoons and you know just everything it was great. It was great meeting you and talking to you. Thank you for having me on. This was really fun. It's uh, it's really nice to talk about Big Ethel because I just love the project so much. It's been really fun to create. Yeah, awesome. And yeah, I will I will message you when things start going haywire in the story. Yes, please, please let me know what you think. <laughs> yep. Awesome. Thank you so so much. And have a great day. Yep.
You too. Time. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Thank you to my current patrons, Susie, Leah Lipris, Lily, Jenny, Molly, Veronica, Emily, Emily, Joe Rochelle, Saucy Tacos, Meg, and Rose, Priya, Alexa, Misty, Joanne, Patty, Milda, Esther, I'm Watching People, Taurus, Papa, Z, Marie, Emily, Jean, Jen, Erin, Kay, Lily, Beckett, Duranda, Christine, Sadie, Kelly, Daniel, Teresa, Mrs. Castaldo, Kaylee, and Jen. Your support is truly appreciated.